excuse me, according, ooh, according to my um, clock, it's time for a start. So if you're able to take your seats, we'll get started with our adult Sunday school class as people are still coming in. And um, it's good to see you out uh, this Lord's Day, a beautiful day after a lot of rain that we've had. We have plenty of rain. We can't complain that we're not getting enough rain, that's for sure. And a busy day yesterday, another wedding was the sixth wedding since December. And there's more on the horizon, so this is going to continue for a while. And then you know what the next thing's going to be? And then all the babies start coming. That's already happening, so busy time, joyful time. But let's, let's begin our um, Sunday school class uh, by seeking the Lord's help in prayer. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you uh, for all of your good blessings you give to us. We thank you for the wedding yesterday evening, and we continue to pray for this newly married couple, uh, Cole and Towns, that your blessing would rest upon their union and that it would be a, a marriage that will be a help to both of them in their way to heaven and that they might be pillars in the church of Christ and raise a godly family to your honor and glory. Now, Father, as we have gathered today on the Lord's Day, we especially thank you for being mindful of us and our tendency to be uh, overcome or overwhelmed and distracted by the things of time and this earth and the great need that we have to pull away from those things and to have an entire day like today in which we can give ourselves with all of our hearts and our full attention to the things of Christ things of your kingdom, the things of your word, uh, the fellowship of the saints. As we come before you today, we do confess that the Christian Lord's Day, the Sabbath, is a delight, not a burden to our hearts. So we pray that you would help us to gain from this day everything that you intend for us as your people. We pray for all of the classes that are meeting and the teachers as they teach their students that your word will be effectual in the hearts of these children and young people, and that uh, it will bring forth uh, the fruit of of faith in Christ and repentance from sin, and that you will save all of our children and young people. And now meet with us in this class as we continue to study the history of the church. May we learn about Christ's power at work, building his church. May we grow in our appreciation of the heritage that has been handed down to us, And may we be strengthened and build up in our most holy faith. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, Those of you who were here last week know that we resumed the study of church history and the cycle of the four different topics that we cover in our adult Sunday school class. We are going to be doing something a little different. We'll be announcing this today, this summer, uh, with a another class or two on church history sprinkled in we're going to have uh, folk we're going to have at least six I believe it is lessons on the subject of finances and Christian principles of finances and we're actually going to have all the classes other than the children's classes in here this summer for that uh, course that uh, Pastor Kennecott is going to be teaching and that's going to start God willing next week so you want to be mindful of that and we really want to encourage everyone to attend that and we're going to be really really strongly urging everyone to do so. But picking up, this is lesson 53 in our study of the history of the church. A little bit of background quickly, the different periods. We are currently in the Reformation period of the history of the church. Uh, We've covered the Reformation in Germany, the Reformation in German-speaking Switzerland, the Reformation in uh, French-speaking Switzerland, and the ministry of Calvin. Uh, the Radical Reformation in Europe, some of the radical fringe groups that grew up during, during uh, the Reformation. And then the Reformation in England, we covered up to the reign of Elizabeth and the Elizabethan, Elizabethan settlement in 1563. And we are currently considering the Reformation in Scotland. And so we began to look at the beginnings of that last week. Uh, we covered the... Um, setting of the Reformation in Scotland, the political setting and the spiritual setting, the early beginnings of the Reformation in Scotland, the ministry of Patrick Hamilton, who was the first real martyr, uh, Protestant martyr in Scotland, and then the ministry of George Wishart, his preaching that was mightily used in Scotland, throughout Scotland, to stir up uh, 
faith in Christ and embrace of Reformed teaching and his martyrdom as well. And you remember one of his assistants who was his bodyguard at the time was John Knox. And uh, we learned about the, uh, after his death, uh, the uh, attempt to assassinate Cardinal Beaton uh, by some of the Protestant leaders. And uh, they're uh, taking over St. Andrew's Castle. And you remember they were, um, for a fairly lengthy period of time, they were under siege there, at the end of which Knox was arrested. And he, was, he spent 19 months as a galley slave on a French galley ship and this is part of the political situation, the, 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 um, the crown in Scotland had political ties with Roman Catholic France over against the English who were more connected to um, uh, Protestant rulers and kingdoms and, and their alliances because the Reformation had already come to England. So, so he's been placed on 19 months as a galley slave. We learned about some of the things that happened after he... If after he was able to leave that, instead of going back to Scotland, he went to England because of the state of things in Scotland at the time. And there he ministered and pastored some churches there. And then he left England when Bloody Mary, uh, the persecuting Mary, who was the sister of Edward, became um, queen in England. She was a Roman Catholic and tried to reestablish Roman Catholicism. And a lot of the Protestant leaders, you remember, fled from England and went to the continent, one of which was, was uh, Knox. He ended up in Geneva with Calvin, and uh, there he pastored an English-speaking congregation for some period of time. But now as we take up today, we begin with Knox's return uh, to Scotland. Now that was a really quick overview of a lot of ins and outs and things that were happening in Scotland that we describe. Uh, but now Knox is about to return to Scotland. And this was in May of 1559. So this leads us now, now we're, this is new material. And he returned at the urgent request of Protestant leaders in the country. And as we begin to consider this period of his life, let me say something first of all about the immediate context leading up to his return. Now roughly 12 years have gone by now since Knox was in Scotland uh, when he was arrested uh, after the siege of St. Andrew's Castle and uh, was uh, assigned to a French galley slave ship. A lot has happened since then. Mary of Geis, who or Geese, who we learned about uh, last week. You remember her? She's the French Roman Catholic widow now of the dead James V of Scotland, King of Scotland. And she was also the mother of now at this point 12-year-old Queen Mary Stuart, who's later going to be known, we're going to talk about her as Mary, Queen of Scots. Well, as, as, Mary, uh, as Mary Stuart is still underage, uh, this Mary Ge Guise now assumed the regency, or the de facto ruler in, of Scotland in 1554. Now, at first, she was tolerant of Protestants, uh, though she was a, an ardent Roman Catholic and was connected to the French court and the, uh, the French uh, 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 crown. Uh, but she had ulterior motives for being uh, tolerant of Protestants at first. She wanted to win them over to her anti-English, pro-French uh, pro policy. <clears throat> but there was continuing to be growing resentment among many of the Scots in the way Scotland seemed to be coming uh, because of these... these uh, these uh, mechanizations and who is ruling and these connect family connections and all the kind of stuff that happens in, in uh, w that period in history with regard to these rulers and who was heir to this throne and that throne, that uh, there was growing resentment uh, among many of the Scots in the way it seemed that Scotland was becoming a, just a province of France. And that resentment grew... When in 1558, young Mary Stuart, the daughter, uh, the, the young daughter, was married to Prince Francis of France, who was the heir to the French throne, and he will eventually become the king of France. <clears throat> now, remember, the, the government of France was uh, militantly Roman Catholic, and so there continues to be something we began to see last week, this kind of coalescing of anti-French uh, sentiment with anti-Roman Catholic sentiment in Scotland. 
quoting Needham, to put it in positive terms, the cause of Scottish nationalism became increasingly identified with the cause of Protestantism in Scotland. So again, there's this religious element, spiritual element, and the political element coming together as we saw last week. And Needham tells us that one of the various means by which uh, Protestantism was kept up among the, the uh, kept popular among the common people and kept alive during this period before while uh, Knox was gone was through um, what is entitled uh, oh, good and godly ballads. Has anybody ever heard of that? The good and godly ballads. It's something most of us have never heard of, but it had a tremendous influence in Scotland. And what was it? Sorry? There's our ugly screen, but we're getting ready to change that, by the way. We're getting ready to get a new camera, so. Um, <clears throat> anyway, what are these good and godly ballads? Well, these were ballads, songs, little songs, compiled by the brothers James and John Wedderburn, although there were others who were also probably uh, contributed to them, and John Wedderburn seems to have been the most prominent figure. He was a priest from Dundee who fled from a heresy charge in 1539 to take refuge in Germany, in Protestant Germany. And while he was there, he became an ardent disciple of Luther and Melanchthon. In 1542, during that brief period at, uh, of pro-Protestant um, period in Scotland, we considered last week when uh, Scotland was governed by the Earl of Arran, um, Wedderburn returned to Scotland. Well, when Cardinal Beaton came back into power, he fled to England and he died there in 1556. But the good and godly ballots, of which Wedderburn seems to have been the main contributor, were mostly uh, satirical, anti-Roman Catholic pieces set to well-known song tunes. You know what satire is? If you, from, how many of you are familiar with the Babylon Bee? And you read the Babylon Well, there you go. That's satire, right? It's kind of, it's kind of a, a poking fun at something in a way that actually connects and is, is really underscoring something and, and, and uh, is uh, exposing something that is wrong and uh, that's actually true. And so these were satirical anti-Roman Catholic songs, many of them, not all of them, but many of them were. And they were very effective also at communicating Protestant doctrine to the common people and promoting a satirical contempt for Roman Catholicism. Now, I want to read a couple of these from you. Now, I, if you look, if you look in, you can look on the internet and you can actually look at the, a book of these, but you're not going to be able to read them. They're, they're in Old English, but not only Old English, it's Old Scottish English. And it's, it's really hard to make out. But these have been translated into modern English. And I'll just, I'll just give you two examples. Here's one. It's called The Pope, That Pagan Full of Pride. That's the title of it. <clears throat> and it goes, that the Pope, that pagan full of pride, he hath us blinded long. For where the blind, the blind doth guide, no wonder both go wrong. Like prince and king, he led the reign of all iniquity. Hey, tricks, trim, go tricks under the greenwood tree. And I have no idea what that means. <laughs> but they would have known what it means. I'm not really sure. Now, here's one that's uh, more um, of a, a doctrinal one. It's called a song of the cross. Come here, saith God's son to me, sinners that heavy laden be. I will your silly souls refresh. Come young and old, both man and wife. I will give you eternal life, though troubled here sore be your flesh. So there's just a small taste of these good and godly ballads by the Wedderburn brothers. And it's an example of how God can use something like this to uh, promote the gospel. And um, now while this was happening on the more popular level, in the more official uh, religious and political context, the Protestant members of the Sc Scottish nobility, there was a significant number of nobility who were friendly to Protestantism. They were becoming increasingly determined to secure a Protestant government for the country. And on December the 3rd, 1557, the leaders of the Protestant nobility banded together by signing a covenant, something that is, is uh, quite uh, 
characteristic of Scottish uh, Reformation thought, and it, you'll see that we're going to see this again, a context where something like this is done again later. But in this covenant, they pledged to renounce Roman Catholicism as the congregation of Satan and to promote a positive reform of worship according to the Anglican Book of Common Prayer, which is basically all they had at that time. They, what, what influence of, much of the influence of Protestantism that they had was coming through, through that context in England. And uh, so they, they, they pledged to promote a positive reform of worship and to secure freedom for Protestant preaching in private. And these Protestant nobles called themselves the Lords of the Congregation of Jesus Christ. And under the protection of these lords, Scottish Protestants began to openly appoint Protestant preachers. In 1558 and 1559, there were outbreaks of iconoclasm. Do you know what that is? Anybody can tell us what iconoclasm is? Well, that's, that's uh, smashing idols. There were these like riots and outbreaks of iconoclasm, people breaking into the Roman Catholic Church or into the monasteries especially and destroying all of the images as a reaction to uh, their coming to recognize the idolatry in those images and being stirred up by various other reasons. And uh, things were really beginning to boil over in Scotland and to reach a crisis point. And then persecution uh, fanned the flames even hotter and the last Protestant martyr to be burned in Scotland was Walter Milne. And this is uh, given as a quote from him. He says, I marvel at your rage, ye hypocrites, who do so cruelly pursue the servants of God. As for me, I am now 82 years old and cannot live long by course of nature. But a hundred shall rise out of my ashes who shall scatter you, you hypocrites and persecutors of God's people. And such of you as now think yourselves the best shall not die such an honest death as I now do. And he was really kind of an obscure person. He was a school teacher who at the age of 82 was burned at the stake at St. Andrews in April 1558. Now this was viewed by many in Scotland as a terrible act of cruelty. And it actually proved to be counterproductive uh, for the Roman Catholic cause. And John Knox once commented that out of the ashes of Will, uh, Walter Milne sprang, quote, thousands of his opinion and religion in Scotland. In July of 1558, Mary of Guise uh, attempted to call the Protestant preachers to account for their activities. But instead, this provoked a show of force by the Protestant gentry of western Scotland who turned out bearing arms uh, to guard their preachers. Uh, Mary panicked and canceled the summons and it was at this point that John Knox returned from Scotland to Geneva. So as we move from the immediate context leading up to his return, we consider now his actual return and what happened. Well upon his arrival <clears throat> he started preaching he just began preaching everywhere. He, he arrived and he preached in Dundee. He preached in Perth with tremendous and powerful effect. Those two cities openly declared themselves to be Protestant communities. His sermon in Perth uh, resulted in another image-smashing riot. Now, he condemned the riot. He wasn't in favor of it, but he, but he didn't condemn the religious zeal that, that lay behind it. Well, at this point, Mary of Guise raised an army mobilizing her forces, an army of 8,000, to crack down on what was happening. In response, Protestants gathered in force in Perth to protect their preachers. And the lords of the congregation, you remember this pact between these nobles that called themselves the lords of the congregation, they began to open negotiations with Protestant England and received a large grant from the English government. And for a time, though, things were kind of back and forth, held in suspense. It didn't look good for the Protestant army. But then in 1560, the entire situation changed dramatically. An English Protestant fleet arrived in what they were called Scotland, the Firth of Forth. It's just outside uh, Edinburgh. And they cut the French supply lines and this event tipped the scales in favor of the lords of the congregation. And in February, they signed the Treaty of Berwick with the English Protestant Queen Elizabeth. 
And in April, an English Protestant army arrived on Scotland's soil. And the French army was put under siege in Leith. And when Mary of Guise died in June, they immediately surrendered. On July 6, the Treaty of Edinburgh brought the withdrawal of both French and English troops from the land of Scotland, and that led to the next very important main event that immediately followed that was the calling of what was called the Reformation Parliament. The Reformation Parliament. And this has been described as, as the most important parliament in the history of Scotland. The parliament met in July and August of 1560 and approved a new thoroughly reformed, not just Protestant, but thoroughly reformed confession of faith for the national church. And this confession, which has come down to us as the Scots Confession, it was actually drawn up by John Knox and five other leading reformed men, who, by the way, all of them were named John. So I remember when I first came to Emmanuel, I felt I kept learning people's names. I thought, it seems like everybody's named John here. It's, it was a common name today, isn't it? Well, it was a common name then, of course. All of these men were named John, uh, six Johns in total. John Knox, John Will, Willock, John Winram, John Spottiswood, John Rowe, and John Douglas. On August, you can look up the Scots Confession online and you can read it, and uh, it's, it's a good confession of faith. On August 24th, Parliament outlawed the Roman Catholic Mass with penalties for its celebration, acknowledged Reformed preachers as alone competent to administer the sacraments, and abolished all papal jurisdiction over Scotland. It was a great victory uh, for the Reformation in Scotland. The tide of public opinion, uh, at least among the educated and ruling classes, had clearly turned in a Protestant and Reformed direction. Now, Mary, Queen of Scots at that time, is still very young. She's now in France. She's married to the French. He was a prince. Now he's the king of France, Francis II. Well, she refused to ratify uh, the legislation put forth by the Reform, uh, Reformation Parliament, and we'll, we'll learn more about her later. But there were two other important documents that came out of this Scottish Reformation, in addition to the Scots Confession. One was the Book of Common Order. Now, you may remember last week we talked about how impressed Knox was with the worship practices and, and the, the order of the churches in, in Calvin's Geneva. Well, this Book of Common Order was Knox's attempt to adopt that order for the worship practices of the church in Scotland. Uh, prior to 1560, Scots Protestants had used the English Book of Common Prayer, but now the new Book of Common Order was adopted, and the reasons were... First, that uh, the uh, English Queen Elizabeth's Book of Common Prayer was not as reformed as they desired. And two, again, while in exile on the continent, Knox developed a love for Calvin's liturgy or his worship order in Geneva. So this new Book of Common Order, it actually will remain the official liturgy. Liturgy is really a, your form of worship, the, the, uh, the elements and and. Uh, process of how you engage in, in your public worship. And this, this becomes the official liturgy of Scottish Protestantism until it was replaced by the Westminster Directory of Public Worship in 1645. And here is the typical order of the worship service. It begins with confession of sin and then a prayer for pardon. So this is a prayer, really. A metric, the singing of a metrical psalm. A prayer for illumination. That means the idea of the Holy Spirit helping us to understand his word now. In which the scriptures were read, the sermon was given, an offering was taken for the poor. And then you have the long prayer, which we might sometimes refer to as the pastoral prayer. A long prayer that would conclude with a recita uh, reciting the Lord's Prayer. Then they would recite the Apostles' Creed. And then sing another psalm. And then have the benediction. So... Very simple form of worship, in some ways similar to our own form of worship, though not exactly the same. The second great document, in addition to the Scots Confession, that came out of the Scottish Reformation, was entitled the Book of Discipline, or the First Book of Discipline. 
And this book contained a, a kind of comprehensive blueprint, really, for the ordering of the church, and really, in many ways, the state and its relationship to the church according to Presbyterian principles, something like our own church constitution and bylaws, but something um, more uh, um, ambitious to, to take in the whole nation and how things were to be organized in the nation. It set out a program of poor relief on a scale that was really unknown in Western Europe until the coming of the welfare state. Also, a massive educational program was drafted in which every parish was to have a school as well as a church. And how was all of that going to be paid for? It was going to be financed by the wealth that had been accumulated by the Roman Catholic Church, which was like insanely wealthy. And so they were going to take all of that wealth and use it to fund these programs. Uh, this was Knox's dream, but sadly, much of this was never truly put into practice. There's a kind of democratic tone to the Book of Discipline that made some of the nobles nervous. And, and some of them, uh, though they were Protestant uh, politically, were still greedy <laughs> at heart, and they preferred themselves to seize the church's wealth. Uh, and so Knox was deeply disillusioned by this. Most of the ministers in the Reformed Church would actually have to subsist on a very meager pay, and his educational vision was only put into practice in a very modified form. And it reminds us, you know, all grand visions for the reformation of a country and a state according to Christian principles, they, they look good on paper, but unless the people themselves are actually true believers, they don't work. They never have in history, ultimately work. Uh, he had a grand vision for this, and there was a lot of good that was done, uh, but to really Christianize the whole nation and, and the nobles to to join in with the whole plan and, and do all of these things, you know, it never happened. And uh, though some things did. Um, but at the same time, the triumph of Protestantism in Scotland was truly amazing. Uh, the Reformation, one of the things the Reformation in Scotland did, it had a profound impact on the, um, the relationship of England to Scotland. Anglo-Scottish relations. It, it forged a kind of new psychological bond between Scotland and England, uh, both united in their resistance to Roman Catholicism, and that helped to pave the way for the union between their monarchies that's going to occur in 1603, and then their parliaments joined together in 1707. Now, a legitimate question that can be raised is how far did this triumph of the Reformation in 1560, how far did it extend to the grassroots level? of the common people in Scotland. Well, from everything that I've read, it, it was mixed. Partly depended on the city that you're talking about. For example, in Edinburgh, uh, after uh, the, the parliament had established these changes and the Protestant church, Reformed church, was established as the, the church of Scotland, uh, there was a big Easter communion service, 1561, and only 1,200 adults out of a population of 12,500 attended the new Reformed worship. At the same time, no one opposed it. There was no vocal opposition that was expressed against it. And that seems to indicate that a majority of the inhabitants of Edinburgh, at least, seem to have really had no commitment to either side of the religious dispute. And that may have been the typical attitude in, in a number of the towns. On the other hand, there were other cities, cities like Perth and Dundee, that were hotbeds of uh, Protestant fervor, and so it took some time for this to really begin to, to grip the hearts of, of people on a large scale across all of southern Scotland, but by the opening decades of the 17th century, the Reformed Church had largely succeeded in evangelizing and Protestantizing, if that's a Protestantizing, if that's a word, uh, the Scottish lowlands or what we call South Scotland. But it never really happened in, in the north, the highlands. You've heard of the highlands of Scotland? The only place where Protestantism found strong support in the highlands was in Argyll, Argyllshire. You don't say Shire. It's Argyllshire. It seems like it should be Shire, but Pastor Hughes corrected me one time uh, when I said Shire in a totally different context. It was actually before I ever came here as a pastor. I was, I was giving lectures at a pastor's conference on Baptist history and later he took me inside and 
sure, not Shire. So Argyle, sure. Now, the rest of the highlands uh, remained, other than that, that one county, uh, remained mostly Roman Catholic with some pagan superstitions mixed in. And, and part of the problem was the language bar barrier. Gaelic was the common tongue of the highlanders, and there were very few Protestant uh, preachers who could speak Gaelic. But there are going to be attempts uh, later to, uh, to bring the gospel and the Reformed faith into the highlands. Well, at this point, let's move from Knox to consider Mary, Queen of Scots, and her reaction to all of this. When the Reformation Parliament met and established the Protestant Church and its Reformed Confession and so on, as I said earlier, Mary was in France. And remember, her, her mother, Mary of, of Guise, had married her off to Francis II, who's now the king of France. The Reformation Parliament... You may, may remember, but it, it met in July, as I said earlier, in August of 1560. Well, in December of 1560, King Francis died. His widow, Mary, uh, Scotland's lawful queen, was just 18 year, years old, and she is staunchly Roman Catholic. And it seemed likely that she would return to Scotland. And Scottish Roman Catholics expected her to return and to overthrow uh, the Reformation settlement. So in early 1561, they sent a, a prominent Roman Catholic clergyman named Leslie from Aberdeen. He visited Mary in France, and he promised her that if she returned to Scotland, the powerful Roman Catholic Earl of Huntley would raise an army of 20,000 to enable her to crush the Protestants and to enter Edinburgh in triumph. On the other hand, many Scottish Protestants also entertained hopes of Mary. Her half-brother, James Stuart, and you want to remember him, he's a key figure in uh, uh, Scottish Reformation history. He's soon to be the Earl of, it's spelled M-O-R-A-Y, but you actually say Murray. He became the Earl of Murray eventually. And he represented the Protestant party, even though he's Mary's half-brother, he visited her, and he was loyal to the Reformation, and he was a man who was held in high esteem by John Knox. It's surmised, we don't really know the conversations that happened, but it is, it, you know, it's kind of a very educated probability, it's, uh, surmised that what he probably did is he promised Mary, we know this because of things that happened after this, that he, he probably promised Mary that the Protestants of Scotland would support her claim to the English throne and try to persuade Elizabeth to appoint her as her heir if she would support the Protestants. Well, in August 1561, Mary arrived in Scotland and set up her court. There's James, by the way. He's a pretty, you know, intimidating-looking fellow, isn't he? Anyway. Wow. Wow. Mary's in there somewhere in that. Uh, she was, from the things that you read, you know, she was apparently, obviously she's young. She was very beautiful. She was charming. She was highly intelligent, very well educated in the learning of the French Renaissance. So, you know, you can tell how beautiful she was, right? <laughs> but, but those qualities uh, won her widespread popularity and few men even devout protestant men could resist her attractions and some of these nobles were kind of falling over themselves with regard to her with the notable exception of john knox he viewed her as an enemy of the reformation was not willing to compromise with her in any way at first Despite her Roman Catholicism, she actually chose to commit herself to the pro-English Protestant party whose figurehead was her half-brother, James Stewart, and its most effective leader was William Maitland. And however opposed both of them were to her Roman Catholic faith, they were staunch advocates of her claim to the English throne. So Mary elevated Stewart to the rank of the Earl of Murray and accompanied him on his military campaign against the Roman Catholic Earl of Huntley. You remember him. He was the one uh, that the Roman Catholics promised would raise an army to crush the Protestants if she, if she came in, in on the Roman Catholic side. Well, she actually marched with this army uh, 
to crush the Earl of Huntley. His forces were annihilated, dealing a great blow to the Roman Catholic hopes in Scotland. And so far, this kind of odd alliance between Mary and the Protestant nobles seemed to be working, but not really. After Mary established herself now in Edinburgh, she arranged for the Roman Catholic Mass to be celebrated. A Protestant mob marched on the palace at that point, and it was only the personal intervention of Murray that stopped them from breaking in, and that didn't sit well with the common people to some degree, and there began to develop a gulf between the Protestant nobility now and the Protestant you know, common folk. And the Queen's Privy Council, at this point, was actually, that was actually made up of Protestant nobles with their political motivations. They were determined to secure for Mary the freedom to practice her faith. The common people, who were led by really the influence of Knox, they regarded the mass as idolatry and were convinced that a Christian state should not tolerate idolatry. And I will add that Knox not only objected to the idolatry and believed the Christian state should not tolerate it, he also saw the lenient attitude of the Privy Council, uh, though made up of Protestants, as a weakening of Protestant resolve and the first step back to Rome. So relations between Knox and Mary is quite strained, understandably. Even before returning to Scotland, Mary had stated that Knox was the most dangerous man in the country and that the country was not big enough to hold both of them. Quoting Needham, Mary had an exalted conception of her royal authority and the obedience owed to her by her subjects, even in matters of religion. Knox held equally exalted views of the duty of a Christian preacher to proclaim God's word without fear or favor, even to monarchs. Now, Mary did not worship at the particular uh, church where Knox preached. He preached at St. Giles, but his sermons were reported to her. She would have spies in the congregation, and uh, Knox condemned in his preaching the frivolity of her court. He denounced the mass, and he called the Protestant nobility to resist her now proposed marriage to the Roman Catholic prince Don Carlos, the son of Philip II of Spain. Because of this, Knox was summoned before her presence. In fact, he was summoned before her four times <clears throat> to give an account of himself. And it's interesting, he really got the better of her in most of these exchanges, sometimes bringing her to tears by his bold uh, declarations of truth. In fact, I want to just read you some excerpts. There were some there uh, when these... Um, interviews happen. For example, Stuart was there, Murray was there, Lord Murray, and ladies-in-waiting who were present. And I just want to read to you just some excerpts of the uh, back and forth between, there's a lot of stuff. I wish I could read all of this to you. It's very fascinating. But let's give you a taste of it. This is Mary speaking. You have taught the people to receive another religion than that which their princes allow. But God commands subjects to obey their prince. Conclusion, you have taught the people to disobey God and their prince. Knox replied, Madam, as right religion received neither its origin nor its authority from princes, but from the eternal God alone, so are not subjects bound to frame their religion according to the taste of their princes. For oft it is that princes of all others are the most ignorant of God's true religion. If all the seed of Abraham had been of the religion of Pharaoh, whose subjects they long were, I pray you, madam, what religion would there have been in the world? And if all in the days of the apostles had been of the religion of the Roman emperors, I pray you, madam, what religion would there have been now upon the earth? And so, madam you may perceive that subjects are not bound to the religion of their princes, although they are commanded to give them reverence. Now, you have to understand, this was like revolutionary at this time in history, this argument, though it's biblical. He goes on, 
Let me just skip over here to another part. She said, you interpret the scripture in one way, and they, Roman Catholics, interpret it in another. Whom shall I believe, and what shall be judge? Knox replied, you shall believe God, who plainly speaks in his word. And farther than the word teaches you, you shall believe neither the one nor the other. The word of God is plain in itself, and if any one place there, excuse me, and if in any one place there be obscurity, the Holy Spirit, who never is contrary to himself, explains the same more clearly in other places, so that there can remain no doubt, but unto such as are obstinately ignorant. And he, at that point, he actually used an example. He illustrated his reply by giving a brief exposition of the passage, one of the main passages that Romanists use to argue for uh, the mass and to show that it's not what the passage actually taught. And he opened that passage up right there in front of the queen. And then he said, Madame, would to God that the learnedest papist in Europe and he that you would best believe were present with your grace to sustain the argument and that you would patiently hear the matter debated to an end. For then I doubt not, madame, you would know the vanity of the papistical religion and how little foundation it has in the word of God. Well, she said, you may perchance get that sooner than you believe. In other words, this debate. Assuredly, said Knox, if ever I get it in my life, I get it sooner than I believe. For the ignorant papist cannot patiently reason, and the learned and crafty papist will not come in your presence, madame, to have the grounds of his belief searched out. For they know that they cannot sustain the argument unless fire and sword and their own laws be judges. And when you shall let me see the contrary, I shall grant myself to have been deceived in that point. At that point, dinner was announced, and this debate ended, and he, his last words was, were, I pray God, madame, that you may be blessed within the commonwealth of Scotland as ever was Deborah in the commonwealth of Israel. So he maintained a, a politeness and a reverence for her office while not compromising the truth and the gospel in any way in his discussions with her. And at times, he, he, at one point, uh, he left her uh, just completely silent for like 10, 15 minutes. And she was just didn't know what to say. And uh, in fact, one of the uh, Stuart, Lord uh, Moray, uh, Murray, he spoke up and said, have you been offended, madame? Or, you know, tried to, what's wrong, you know? And so uh, finally she, she took up the discussion again. So it's quite amazing to read. Um, after, but after the fourth interview that she had with him, Mary lost patience with him, and she put Knox on trial for treason. And Knox's trial took place before the Privy Council, which, remember, was made up of these kind of wishy-washy Protestant nobility. But you know what they did? They unanimously acquitted him. Uh, this was to Mary's disgust. But what really brought the downfall of Mary was not Knox. It was her own foolish actions. In 1565, she fell in love with young Henry Stewart, or Lord Darnley. Lord Darnley, Darnley. He was a Roman Catholic. She married him according to the Roman Catholic ceremony in July, and this then alienated even the moderate Protestant nobles. They saw this marriage then uh, as a first step toward the destruction of their power and of Protestantism in Scotland. Uh, so Mary, because that was their attitude toward the marriage, she decided to make a preemptive strike at Murray, believing he was plotting to kidnap Darnley, she summoned him to court, but he refused to come. And then he was joined by Aaron and other leading Protestant nobles determined to protect their freedom. Mary declared them rebels and marched on them at the head of an army. They eventually fled across the border. Mary seemed to have triumphed, but then again she shot herself in the foot, as it were. Her marriage to Darnley, it wasn't so great after all. He wasn't, he wasn't quite the guy she hoped he would be, I guess. And uh, you know, it wasn't turned out very well or to her liking, and she fell in love with somebody else. 
uh, she increasingly came under the sway of her Italian counselor, David Rizzio. You know those tall, dark Italians. You know, she, she <laughs> fell in love with him now and darnly became insanely jealous. And in March 1566, he took part in a plot to eliminate Rizzio. A band of men, including Darnley, broke into Holyrood, Holyrood Palace into the Queen's supper room where her and Donnelly, uh, her and Rizzio were dining, and they dragged Rizzio away and stabbed him to death. Now that, of course, destroyed any loyalty Mary had to Darnley. It didn't, it didn't like win her back over to him. Um, and soon she began to cast her affections toward another man this time a Protestant, the Protestant Earl of Bothwell, James Hepburn. He was, by the way, a married man. I know, it's kind of crazy. It's kind of like a soap opera. (laughs) Darnley, the other guy, the one that uh, had Rizzio murdered, Darnley was strangled by murderers in Kirko Field, a church just outside the walls of Edinburgh, and the church was blown up. And popular opinion was that this Bothwell guy was behind it. A few months later, Bothwell kidnapped Mary, kidnapped, quote, appearance of kidnap. He kidnapped Mary. He took her to Dunbar Castle. Bothwell's divorce from his wife was then hurried through the courts, and he and Mary were married on May 15, 1567, according to a Protestant ceremony. You get the idea Mary wasn't really committed to, you know, necessarily anything but her own, you know, her own lusts and her own desire for power. And, um, well, you know what that did? That alienated her from the Catholics, the Roman Catholics. She was already alienated from the Protestants. The Protestant nobility were already hostile to her. By marrying a Protestant, she lost the support of the Roman Catholics James Morton, the Earl of Morton, raised a Protestant army against her and trapped her smaller forces at Carberry Hill. They demanded that she hand over Bothwell for trial on the charge of Darnley's murder. And I just looked at the clock. We're out of time. Uh, Mary arranged the escape of Bothwell to Norway. Then she surrendered. She was imprisoned in Loch Leven Castle, forced to abdicate the throne on July 24th, 1567, in favor of her newborn baby son, James the sixth, and so Murray now becomes the de facto ruler of Scotland, the regent of Scotland. And I won't go. I'm, I'm out of time here, but to just say there was a. She was kept in prison there for a time. She eventually was liberated. There was a battle, civil war. Her army was defeated. She fled to England, thinking maybe Elizabeth would be kind to her and take her in because at least we share nobility. Uh, you know, the we're, we're related to one another. But of course, Elizabeth didn't want her there because. Mary's supporters had for a long time claimed that she was the rightful queen of England. And so when she arrived in England, Elizabeth didn't receive her with open arms. She put her in prison. And so she was in prison for quite a number of years until she was implicated in a plot to murder Elizabeth, at which point Elizabeth had had enough and Mary was executed. And that brought the end to her life. Knox... um, Eventually died, of course, in 1574. He was buried in the churchyard of St. Giles Kirk. Morton's kind of famous epitaph at his funeral was, There lies one who neither feared nor flattered any flesh. And there, there was a civil war. The King's Party, led by Murray. The Queen's Party, those who were favorable to Mary, led by uh, the Roman Catholic armies and uh, Murray a one, or they triumphed in the Civil War. And so Scotland was established as a Protestant country at that point. So there you go. It's a lot of stuff. Did you take all that in? Okay. All right, our time's up. I'm sorry, I went a little long. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you today for the opportunity to consider these things and to be inspired by those who have gone before us and also to learn from their mistakes. And Lord, we know that ultimately the power of the gospel is not merely tied to the sword or tied to, or even tied, tied to the sword, but it's in the power of the Holy Spirit to change the hearts of men. And we pray, Lord, that even in our day that the gospel will 
be accompanied by your spirit, that you will change the hearts of men, and that we will see revival in our land and true reformation in our churches. Now help us as we prepare to worship you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.